through the words from my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I have a large extended family with about 20 first cousins. And Lord only knows how many once removed and second cousins that I have at this point. However, it has been my privilege to grow up knowing a lot of people and being able over time to see how their lives are progressing because of the choices they and their parents made. I have so many relatives that I feel I can use one of them as sermon and pretty well guarantee his anonymity. <laughs> no chance here. <laughs> One of my cousins studied to be a civil engineer because he had that sort of mind where once you calculate properly, you can build something to stand forever. But then he lost his wife to cancer. And in the process, he found Jesus. As anyone might imagine, the kind of church he prefers sort of fits that civil engineering mindset. If you follow the rules and make the right calculations to do the right things and believe the right things, then you will go to heaven. And as a result, when his sister was dying of cancer, he came to her bedside to be sure that she believed the right thing to do so that one day she would meet, he would meet her. It turned out she did. But he told her at that time that their father, who didn't believe, probably was not either. After reviewing our portion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I say with some certainty, that my cousin is like the Christians in Corinth, who received the beginning tablet of the faith by some seed planting pastor like Paul, and that seed may have been watered by other pastors, but it has yet to grow into what it could be. If such a Christian as my cousin were to encounter a pastor like Jesus, as Jesus is portrayed in Matthew today, he might jump start, he might jump start growth out of just sheer fears. <laughs> this is what Matthew says with his fears. You have heard it said in those ancient times, shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with your brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the fire of hell. I think my cousin, bound to the letter of the law, would be required at least to go beyond that law and consider his attitude as something that might be modified. Jesus goes uh, uses the threat of the fire of hell to recommend that people dissolve their anger, and it is the implied cause of murder, and to seek reconciliation before they dare worship in the temple. Jesus also suggests that the commandment demands uh, that everyone avoid adultery, and one who should go further should avoid the step leading to adultery, and that would be lust and the private admiring of someone's physique. Jesus also attacks the need for swearing an oath, saying that this is only necessary because we lie. <laughs> and therefore, we should stop lying. <laughs> Why, we might ask, is Matthew so interested in making the Ten Commandments harder? What is Matthew doing here? Well, there is an answer. 
he is defending Jesus to his fellow Jews who claim that Jesus was trying to abolish the law. And Matthew is trying to show here that Jesus was fulfilling the law. Jesus does this in this passage by encouraging people to examine the cause of breaking any of the Ten Commandments and root out the cause before they actually break the law. However, without a pastor to teach my cousin about the background of this passage, a new Christian like my cousin might be tempted just to make a harder set of rules than he must follow. What is lacking in Matthew's passage is a reasonable method by which to remove that anger and that lust and ultimately the habit of lying, which underpins the necessity for the commandments. We have to look even further back in time, not Paul's era and not Matthew's, to find the help about how to do this. And oddly enough, we find it way back in the Old Testament and Deuteronomy, which might be the last place to look. <laughs> Here's the passage from the NRSV translation. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God by loving God, the Lord your God, and walking in God's ways and observing his commandments, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord will bless you in the land you are entering. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, I declare to you today that you shall perish. Did any of you catch the piece of information that might make doing what Jesus suggests possible? Where's the key? I think the key is this, by loving the Lord your God. This is what I think is missing from my cousin's approach to Christianity. It is also missing, at least from the passage of Matthew, from this passage of Matthew, though I don't think it's missing from the whole gospel. It is by love of God that we find the power to walk in God's ways. In fact, I would go so far to say this by loving God that God grants us the power of love in our lives. And out of that love, we find a way to love our brother and our sister. This is how we can replace our anger with love and reconciliation as Jesus in Matthew's gospel recommends. This is how we avoid being obsessed with anything like lust or lying or any other state that would draw us away from godly ways. We do so by loving God. So, even if we love God and walk in God's ways, we are going to get sidetracked. We will resist evil, but still, we will fall into sin. So, while we may not murder, there will be definite moments when we wish we could. <laughs> And while we may not commit adultery, there may be moments when we wish we could. <laughs> and while we may never formally swear falsely, there are moments when we lie just because it's convenient. <laughs> How fast we walk out of those dead end, sin filled alleys depends. Not so much in our fear of God's reprisal, the death of the fire of hell, which is what I guess my cousin fears. Instead, it will largely depend on how miserable we feel about not loving God and not feeling God's love at work within us. The good news is that, not mentioned in our reading today, it is the restoration of God, which is always possible. 
to paraphrase our baptism, we persevere in resisting evil, and whenever we fall into sin, we repent and return to the Lord. I just love the glory of the Lord. <laughs> it's not possible for us not to do it. Sarah. Another piece of good news is that more often we resist evil, fail, and repent, the better we get at resisting. And also, we grow in our gratitude for our forgiveness. And therefore, loving God comes more easy. And forgiving one another comes more easy. And thus, lust and anger and lying dissipate over time, though they never dissipate. 